I think radical design has taken on this new perspective within contemporary design. It started to become really significant because the 1960s and 70s was a point at which design really started to deal with environmental crisis, political crisis, social inequality. It was a complete turnaround from uh, post-war, immediate post-war design that was all about abundance and consumption. And I think that really rings true with contemporary designers. They have a crisis. Why should they be making more objects when we simply don't need that many? And as digital technology comes to the fore, why do we even need to think in terms of form? Design has become about ideas. It's become about change through theory and speculation as much as through stuff. If we think of what happened in Italy in 1968, the Milano um, Fair, this, you know, the world-renowned exhibition of design had been ransacked by activists and students. The title of the Milan Fair of 68 was For the Greater Number, and it had been an attempt to make it a political intervention by the curator that failed miserably because the activists knew this wasn't designed for the greater number, it would just be the same old consumer design, and it would just perpetuate the idea of design as a capitalist tool. So global tools, the radical Italians, were about really breaking down this very class-specific model of design. I think when we look at the radical designers now, we tend to look at the kind of romance of uh, design for the domestic landscape, new design for the domestic landscape, uh, a, a notion of, of design without objects. But the, 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 the discourse was really embedded in real anti-bourgeois, quite radical left-wing politics that was heavily influenced by neo-Marxist voices. Iconic Italian designers like Ettore Sozzas exhibited at Italy, the new domestic landscape at MoMA in 72. And he made iconic office furniture and of course the Valentine typewriter. But just four years later, Sozzas also exhibited at Man Transforms at the Cooper Hewitt in 76, also in New York. But by that time, he'd had a kind of crisis of conscience and was creating extraordinarily abstract black and white photography around really the kind of theoretical idea about design. He wasn't dealing with objects in that exhibition at all. And for me, that's really fascinating that the Italian radicals represented this crisis that we can really relate to now within design and its purpose. Is design even a a term that's useful anymore. But we look back to the examples of the Italian radicals and we can see that the crisis was being engaged with at a much deeper level. For example, the notion that design practice and design theory were separate entities would have been unheard of during that period. All of these designers were engaging at a very high level with theoretical debates of the period and political debates of the period from uh, people like and Antone Negre talking about workers' rights, to people like Wolfgang Haug in Germany talking about commodity aesthetics and the role of design in, in, within the capitalist system. So there was this notion that there could be the potential for an alternative economy of objects or non-objects, where instead of spending our time consuming, actually we, were, we had more time to be good citizens and politically engaged citizens. So it's really important not to just look at that period in aesthetic or quite romantic and nostalgic terms, but to really realise it's a point at which design had the potential to be something else. In a way, this period of radicalism became a lost dream because by the 80s, design is all about individuals. It's all about hyper-design. It's all about brands, labels, corporate sanctioning of, of design culture. So that 70s radicalism is completely lost by the 80s. So we have iconic designers like Philip Stark creating the stereotypical lemon squeezer. This is the antithesis of thinking around radical design as an alternative proposition for life. And I think that's because it's historically, in the 1980s, you see the rise of the kind of neoliberal economy that the radical designers were pitting themselves against. The decline they saw in the future, the decline of state provisioning. They saw the dominance of capitalism and corporate capitalism. And so the ideas from the late 60s and 70s are really 
have such resonance now because their predictions are entirely fulfilled within the 21st century. And I think the big crisis for design now is what are we doing with designers as they're educated? What's the relationship of the market to the state in terms of provision? Much design 30, 40 years ago was actually state provisioned. So you, one could change the world through the design of hospitals. But as we've seen the increasing privatization of some of those sectors, education, planning, medical areas, you know, what role does the designer have? Is the designer this bridge between the corporation and, and the, the mainstream population? There's a crisis also in terms of thinking about the designer's role in, in terms of, you know, whom should they represent? Do they represent a corporation or some much more utopian model of, you know, modernist model of representing the masses? That interdisciplinarity in the 60s really had a political, a really political and ideological thrust behind it. Now it's just often about a corporate desire to reach new markets, new cross-cultural, new transnational markets. There's perhaps a bit more cynicism involved. That isn't to say that there isn't enormous potential for designers today, but maybe then there's a call, maybe there should be a call for re-engaging with theory and politics at a very serious level like the pre our predecessors within design.